I will uh, I will start our event. Um, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, depending on your time zone. I'm uh, Xavier Pasco. I'm the director of uh, FRS, um, uh, Paris-based think tanks devoted to uh, uh, international security and defense issues. I'm, I'm really delighted that FRS can host this event today, organized uh, at the occasion of the, the release of the latest report by the Chicago uh, Council of Global Affairs entitled uh, Preventing Nuclear Proliferation and Reassuring America's Allies. Uh, in my eyes, this report makes a significant contribution uh, to the debate on the necessity to Say, to reinvent uh, a more active or maybe a more proactive uh, diplomacy that can adapt to multiple dynamics and challenges in the field of uh, non proliferation and, and, and collective security, let's say. Um, uh, it involves a revitalization of multilateralism, a reassessment of deterrence in Asia in particular, and also uh, maybe a, a reassessment of the role a threatened European defense can play in all this. Um, so um, this is, in my view, the richness of this uh, work to consider these different dimensions of today's tragic environment and to propose food for thought, in a sense, <laughs> uh, at a very timely moment, in my view, and we, we all know the, the particular moment we are living in, um, and also in terms of uh, changing and um, maybe evolving political dynamics throughout the world. So I would like to thank warmly uh, Mr. Ivo Dadler, uh, uh, the president of the Chicago Council uh, on Global Affairs, uh, and in this occasion also the project director for this work. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for, for being with us today. And I would like to thank, of course, uh, Sir uh, Michael Rifkin also uh, for this occasion, one of the three uh, uh, co-chair of the task force has uh, put up this report. Thank you also, Francois, <laughs> for this, uh, for the idea and for putting this, uh, helping, helping us uh, uh, organizing this. You are special advisor at FRS, and you've been one of the uh, member of the task force. Uh, thank you for that. I will, uh, I will be very eager to to hear the discussion. I will stop there. Uh, I will give now the floor to uh, Bruno Tertre, uh, deputy director of FRS. Uh, we will open and, and moderate. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 the future, uh, uh, the discussions we'll have uh, uh, together on this. And, and, and thank you to all, and I now give you the floor, Bruno. Thank you very much, Xavier. I will not make any long introductions because we only have one hour. I will first give the floor to uh, Ivo uh, as the uh, project director, then to uh, Malcolm and to Francois. I will make very short comments afterwards because I think this report does deserve a discussion. I'll have my own ideas. Then I will open the floor and feel free to open the floor to uh, uh, put your questions as usual, or you know the drill by now, in the uh, Q&A, um, uh, or to raise your hand, but I can't see you if you raise your hand, it's not open, so uh, you will have to do it uh, uh, um, in the, uh, the Q&A, please. But without further ado, um, I will now give the floor to Evo for a general presentation and introduction to this very interesting and extremely timely report. Evo, the floor is yours for approximately seven to eight minutes, if that's okay. Well, terrific. Thank you, uh, Bruno, and thank you, uh, Xavier, for uh, uh, hosting uh, us here today uh, on this report. Let me uh, uh, tell you a little bit where the report came from. Uh, I'll also you know, highlight some of the, the key findings, but I think it's important to put it in context. Um, uh, as, as a result of you know, differences across the alliance, uh, both across the Atlantic and across the Pacific of the United States with its allies, which started before Donald Trump, but became, uh, frankly, uh, significant uh, after his, uh, his uh, election. Uh, the question of alliance reliability and the credibility of American, uh, America's nuclear guarantee to its allies, an issue that really we hadn't been debating in one form or another since uh, probably the late 1970s, early 1980s. Uh, was put on the table. Uh, you may recall that uh, during the election campaign in 2016, Donald Trump had called NATO obsolete 
uh, and had said that uh, having uh, South Korea or Japan acquiring nuclear weapons to defend themselves was not something he was particularly concerned about. Uh, it led uh, uh, me and my colleagues over in the Chicago Council on Global Affairs to say, well, wait a minute, uh, uh, let's have a discussion uh, about these issues and let's have a discussion with our allies. And in fact, the four of us were together, I believe in November of 2018 in a meeting uh, in Berlin where we started talking about how should we think about the nuclear relationship between the United States and its uh, and non-nuclear allies in Europe. Uh, we did another workshop in Honolulu uh, with our Asian allies, and then we put together this task force uh, co-chaired by Sir Malcolm Rifkin, uh, Chuck Hagel, former Defense Secretary of the United States, and Kevin Rudd, uh, as a former Prime Minister uh, of Australia, uh, with four uh, additional uh, uh, officials from, uh, former officials from Asia, eight from Europe, and uh, another two uh, from uh, the, United, uh, the United States, uh, so 16 uh, members, members in total. And, and we looked at what are the challenges that are confronting the alliances in Europe and Asia, the relationship between uh, the allies and, uh, and the United States, and how do we manage that, those in a way that reduces the incentive uh, for allies to potentially think about, uh, let alone acquire their own nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, the, the way we thought about this, there really are four sort of major ch nuclear challenges that are confronting uh, the United States and its allies. Of course, uh, the modernization of the Russian uh, nuclear arsenal, which continues, and even with the extension of New START, there is a significant uh, uh, growing uh, nuclear dimension to the relationship of Russia has with not only the United States, but uh, with Europe. China, which is rising not only uh, in its economic and, and, and military, but also its nuclear uh, dimension and is posing uh, challenges to uh, allies in Asia uh, and indeed beyond. North Korea, which continues uh, unabated in acquiring its own uh, nuclear capabilities, uh, including uh, new missiles that uh, ought to be capable of reaching the east coast of the United States, thus raising the very dilemmas that the United States and Europe have been uh, working uh, to, to resolve since the late 1950s when the Soviet Union uh, could reach uh, the United States uh, with its missiles. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the reality that in Iran, uh, the nuclear uh, genie was starting to escape once again from the bottle and the question of what that raised for security for our allies. And it raises the, raised the question, if the nuclear dimension in the threat that is confronting allies is enhanced, what is the response? Um, and it is an issue that uh, we thought uh, needed to be discussed because one of the possible responses is for those nations to acquire their own nuclear capabilities. And there are quiet debates uh, in, in countries uh, uh, that are non-nuclear today about whether that decision ought to be revisited. It's well to remember that Germany and Japan, to take two of those countries, were reluctant to sign on to the nuclear non-proliferation policy uh, a treaty. They signed on uh, and took uh, respectively five and six years to ratify that treaty because they wanted to be sure that their nuclear security would be guaranteed uh, if they remain non-nuclear powers. And so the US nuclear guarantee has long been a central element in the non-proliferation policy uh, of, uh, uh, of the United States and others with regard to, uh, to our allies. How to maintain that? That was the question we uh, posed. And the answer, uh, I will be very brief because the recommendations we made are significant, but let me sort of highlight four big uh, conclusions that we came uh, uh, from. One, uh, that at the core, it, it is absolutely necessary for the United States to reaffirm its fundamental security commitment to all of its uh, alliances across the Atlantic uh, and bilaterally with all of its, uh, its allies in Asia. That without that recommitment in a very fundamental and visible sense, including in terms of maintaining troop levels, in terms of uh, signing long-term basing agreements, uh, without that commitment, doubts about the American guarantee and the American uh, security guarantee, as well as the nuclear umbrella, uh, uh, would, uh, would increase. So that is fundamental. And if there is military steps that are necessary to, to make 
that reaffirmation credible, uh, uh, whether that's conventional forces, additional missile defenses, or indeed beginning a discussion uh, if the allies so desire on the question of nuclear deployments, that is something that ought to be uh, opened up. At the same time, the U.S. also ought to bring allies into the nuclear planning, its own nuclear planning process, far more uh, than it has done, uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So that's number one. Number two is that the Europeans, uh, as our uh, allies, need to do more uh, for their own defense. And uh, here we make two sort of big recommendations that I think Francois and, and, and Malcolm will focus on, so I'll just mention them. One is that this debate about strategic autonomy is really not necessarily a debate, it's a debate to, to be had, uh, but the point should be to enhance Europe's capacity to act uh, and how it does so is, uh, and, and, and whether it does so is less important than that it is able to do so. And then secondly, that this also should include a nuclear dimension and the question of deepening Franco-British uh, 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 cooperation on nuclear uh, matters and, and, and perhaps uh, looking into extending uh, the nuclear deterrence to uh, cover European, the European allies is something that we think needs to be on the table. Uh, third, uh, uh, turning to Asia, uh, a series of steps that we um, uh, propose to enhance the credibility of the nuclear umbrella, perhaps the most interesting and the one that is getting, generating the most debate uh, in, in Asia is the idea of creating an Asian nuclear planning group that would consist of the United States, Korea, Japan, and Australia. Uh, and uh, to have the deepening discussions about nuclear matters that have long been the case in, in, in NATO, although uh, they have become formulaic in NATO, uh, as I can tell you from my own experience, uh, that needs to be deepened uh, and, and, and multilateralized. Uh, we have a number of other steps that we think are necessary to enhance uh, the Asian security dimension um, but I will leave it at, uh, at that uh, and happy to go into detail in, in, in Q&A. And then the final step is the, uh, is the uh, reformulation of the arms control agenda. We do think there is uh, more to be done on arms control uh, that cannot be uh, uh, no longer, when, it when the issue is nuclear weapons, can no longer just be about Russia and the United States, although as the major powers that have more nuclear weapons 90 plus percent of all nuclear weapons on, uh, in the world, they need to continue to a bilateral uh, discussion and negotiation. But it is time, we think, that there be a discussion about strategic stability and greater nuclear uh, transparency that includes all of the five permanent members of, this, of the uh, UN Security Council, who are also, by the way, of course, nuclear powers. So that's the, uh, that's the, 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 the thrust of the report. Um, uh, lots more detail in it. Uh, it, it we, we crammed a lot of stuff into 20 pages. Uh, so uh, uh, do read it uh, when you have a chance, but I think this, uh, this summarizes basically where we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivo, and I do concur. It's a, uh, it's a very dense report, but it's, uh, then it's only 20 pages, so uh, you will need to read it, and it doesn't take that much time, but it is very dense and crap and packed with ideas. Uh, so Malcolm, please. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, I was very delighted to be asked to take part in the task force uh, initiated by the Chicago Council. And I was delighted for this reason, that essentially it had identified a serious gap in public debate and in government priorities uh, throughout the world. Uh, there's been a lot of debate about nuclear proliferation. That goes back a long way and people have been concerned. But the primary concern and the primary debate is what happens if the bad guys choose to go nuclear, whether it's Iran or whether it's North Korea or some rogue state. Uh, that has been the main focus of the debate that has been about proliferation. Uh, what this study concentrates on is the good guys. Uh, what happens if for reasons that nobody is encouraging necessarily, certainly since Trump's departure, but which cannot be excluded, uh, that uh, what happens if in Germany, uh, if in Japan, if in South Korea, all impeccable democracies, and there are others like Italy and Spain and so forth, uh, if they feel uh, that they are no longer able to assume uh, a United States uh, nuclear guarantee. 
Now that's not on the cards at the moment and with President Biden, it's unlikely to happen in the foreseeable future. But you cannot just think of it in those terms because Trump was in part the cause of the problem, but he was also a consequence of a growing mood in the United States that Europe is not necessarily doing all it could do uh, to deal with its own defense requirements. Uh, and uh, that is leading to a potential decline in political commitment that even a, a president of the United States who wished to uh, might be able to maintain. And we're not talking about two years or five years. When you're in dealing with nuclear weapons, you're dealing with 20, 30, 40, 50 years. At some time during that period, the next half century, we cannot exclude that uh, development uh, taking place. Now that leads us also to the particular European dimension here uh, that I'm commenting on, uh, and that is the uh, e extent to which uh, Europe not only has to contemplate a more serious commitment to its own defense in terms of defense expenditure and improving its capability, and these issues are mentioned in the report, but let me concentrate on these very few short introductory comments on the nuclear dimension. Because it so happens, Western Europe has two nuclear powers, nuclear weapon states, France and the United Kingdom. And historically, uh, they have operated rather separately from each other. Uh, the United Kingdom deterrent has been committed to NATO from the very beginning. Uh, France has seen it as a force de frappe and seen it very much as a national uh, asset. Uh, but the public debate on that is beginning to change. And you know, the, the, in the origins of this debate about the Franco and British uh, nuclear weapons and the extent to which they might jointly be able to do something uh, that would be for the benefit of Europe as a whole. It hasn't just begun since Trump. Um, I, when I was Defense Secretary in 92 to 95, so some time ago, and I remember a dialogue I had with Francois Lyotard, who was then the French Defense Minister. And we both as individuals were very committed to the idea of trying to get a, a greater cohesion, uh, greater dialogue, greater exchanges and uh, familiarity between the French and British uh, nuclear dimensions, nuclear deterrence. It, it turned out we were premature, uh, not only with the public opinion, but our, our own political colleagues, both in Paris and in London, did not see it either as a priority or necessarily as realistic. I think the mood has changed considerably. And one of the most extraordinary developments of the last three or four years, at a time when the United Kingdom's relationship with its European neighbors inevitably has been, to put it mildly, fragile and difficult because of Brexit, Franco-British defense cooperation has never been better on bilateral matters, including dialogue on nuclear uh, weapons. So if that's been possible in the circumstances of the last two or three years, we must build on that. And I was particularly interested, as I'm sure we all were, that President Macron uh, did indicate at one stage a French interest in a European Security Council, uh, some form of European security dimension. Uh, and of course, he, he went out of his way to say, the United Kingdom it doesn't have to be just from members of the EU necessarily, on an issue of this kind, uh, all European countries might be interested in some form of contribution. I'm very interested in that idea. I think it's something that should be built on. That's all I want to say at this stage, but there's a lot that is of relevance, not just to the United States, uh, but also to Europe and within Europe. Uh, and uh, that applies to nuclear weapons as it does to so many other issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Malcolm. And since you mentioned it, um, you probably don't know or don't remember, Sir, Sir Malcolm, but I actually happen to be the junior French staffer for the uh, French British Nuclear Commission that you uh, set up in '93. And I recall how much of an extraordinary intellectual and political adventure it was, because indeed you led the way for us to uh, begin. You opened the pathway, so this led ultimately, as you know, to the uh, Czechos Declaration. I we've known each other for quite a long time, Bruno. I have <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to testify to the importance of uh, the initiative that uh, Sir Malcolm took at the time with, uh, with Ministers Jacques and Leonta and their, uh, their successors. Uh, Francois, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, thank you, Ivo, for having made this uh, whole exercise uh, possible. And I'll actually begin with the procedural point. Uh, which has substantive implications, and that is, this is a global report. That is, uh, this is not the nuclear issue viewed through the NATO lens or through any other regional lens. Uh, it looks at things globally. That has a, a basic advantage, and that is uh, the usual group thing could simply not happen because we were too diverse a group 
for that to happen. And I think the report has benefited greatly from that. Uh, on the substance, uh, first of all, uh, and I'll, I'll quote from the report, always useful to do that. Uh, the report uh, suggests that one should raise the salience of nuclear weapons issues in alliance relations. That may sound in a way rather dire, uh, but it isn't because the primary focus of the report, the starting point of the report, is how to avoid nuclear proliferation. That's one of the starting points. And one of the ways we have found over the previous decades to uh, stem nuclear proliferation was uh, to provide credible nuclear guarantees to allied countries so that they would not feel the need to engage in their own nuclear ventures. And that has been quite successful. It was actually successful both in the, in the American sphere, uh, but it was also successful in the Soviet sphere for that matter during the Cold War. And uh, to raise the nuclear, their salience in nuclear weapons is one way of fighting proliferation. It's not intuitive, but it's very real. Second substantive point on European strategic autonomy, which has been mentioned. Here again, I'll quote from the report. Far from fearing European autonomy, the United States should embrace it. Now, I don't know to what extent this report accurately reflects the mainstream feeling in the Biden administration insofar that it has been, had had an opportunity to start thinking about these issues beyond specialist circles. But that is a tone and an approach which we have not seen under previous American administrations. It was either the Trumpian, oh yeah, you want, you want to go off on your own? Well, do so, you know, good riddance. Or it was Madeleine Albright saying useless duplication, dangerous decoupling, uh, uh, unacceptable discrimination, don't want to hear about it. This is a very different approach. If this is in effect the way the Americans will approach this, that will make for a very different dialogue between the Americans and the Europeans. Uh, third substantive point, uh, and this is one uh, which I venture on with some delicacy uh, because we didn't really explore it in much depth during the report itself. We had to cover a lot of ground. And that is, uh, A, uh, one cannot emphasize, one cannot overemphasize the fact that nuclear missions engage practically every single member of the Atlantic Alliance. That it's, it's not simply the two states, the UK and France, and the United States, of course, and or the countries which have American nuclear weapons performing NATO nuclear missions, the four Euro Europeans, Italy, Belgium, etc. But practically every other NATO country participates in NATO mission planning. There are support roles, conventional support roles, which are part of the common alliance culture. And this is actually not a bad starting point if one wants to start thinking about how one can organize extended deterrence in the future. And this, by the way, also applies uh, to the French and British uh, dimensions thereof. And the last point, uh, one which may be of particular interest to my French compatriots, as indeed to Malcolm's, uh, as members of the P5, of course, the Americans, and that is, uh, there are a number of suggestions which are made on the permanent five dimension of nuclear stability and arms control. I invite you to look at these carefully, but there's one suggestion in particular, uh, which I'd like to share. And that is the suggestion that uh, other countries, uh, notably uh, other nuclear countries like China, should be invited by the Americans and the Russians to see how one goes about inspecting and verifying nuclear arms control agreements 
in the framework of the bilateral American, Soviet, and then Russian uh, arms control agreements. Uh, this could be actually be turn out to be something quite interesting. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Francois. Uh, we have a pretty good turnout. I see that it's about 50 participants, so I'm sure we'll get plenty of questions and comments. However, um, I'd like to kick in by making a very quickly three brief sets of remarks. First, I'd like to emphasize two important ideas that I think I put forward in the report. Uh, these ideas are not entirely new, but I think they are very important. So it's uh, indeed of importance that this report um, underlines them. One is the idea of going back to having political leaders training into thinking about nuclear crisis, war gaming um, in the uh, in the political military sense of the term, I think is a lost art at the political level. And that's quite unfortunate because I think that many of our political leaders have lost uh, the, uh, uh, the, not the habit, but the practice of thinking about the terrible choices that they may face in a nuclear uh, crisis. The second idea is the one that uh, Francois mentioned, the idea of um, uh, regarding arms control, there is the proposal to include all warheads, which I think makes sense to me. Uh, and there is also the inspection um, point that Francois just emphasized. I think it is indeed an important idea. This is this has already began to um, be uh, floated around over the, over the past uh, six months. But I think it's important that this uh, report emphasize the need to think seriously about this. So. Congratulations for that contribution. Second point, uh, dare I say for the sake of the debate, the three points that I'm a little skeptical about, um, have uh, NATO allies contributed uh, as early as possible in US nuclear planning? Um, I believe, Ivo, tell me if I'm right, but I think there is still a UK, well, Sir Malcolm would know, there's still a UK officer in Omaha, at Stratcom in Omaha, but there's no other uh, allied present. But there's a reason why there is a UK officer there is that because there is potentially joint uh, US-UK planning. So I'd like to push a little bit forward, Ivo, on how he thinks the uh, US system would react to such a proposal, which I don't think is a bad idea. And indeed, uh, anything that makes allies more um, knowledgeable about the reality of nuclear planning, perhaps, to a certain level only, but at, uh, at least to a certain level, uh, it would be very useful. How would that be received in the United States? Uh, second question, or second thing I was a little skeptical about, is this idea of an NPG in Asia. Now, I, uh, I thread carefully here because uh, uh, Evo is probably the person, in, uh, not only in this panel, but one of the persons in the world that knows the NPG uh, the best. But can you have an NPG without a NATO? Uh, my point here is not only rhetorical, is to say how much can you achieve by putting these, these four countries together at the same table where it's barely, to the best of my knowledge, it's, very, it's, it's barely feasible to have South Korea, Japan and the United States talking seriously about uh, nuclear operations and planning. It's more a question mark for me than a criticism, but I'd like to push forward a little bit on this. And finally, on the question of uh, the extension of French and UK nuclear uh, deterrent, I'm, I was a bit surprised by this because Samar can correct me if I'm wrong, but the UK already extends, uh, in a sense, its uh, nuclear deterrent, uh, I mean, more, uh, more clearly than the French do, at least to uh, Europe and NATO. And on the French, well, uh, you would surprise nobody on this panel if I say that so far uh, our allies, especially under Biden, uh, have not, um, uh, are not um, uh, banging the door uh, in Paris to say we want an open nuclear protection. So, I mean, as much as I think these ideas make sense, and it's in a sense the sense of history, um, I wonder how you know how much traction we would get in Europe, especially given the pretty low-key response that uh, there has been to Macron's February 2020 uh, speech. That being said, I think there is ground for something like a joint French-British reflection on what we could achieve now together in, term, in rhetorical and policy and declaratory policy terms with the new status of the UK, which is now outside of the EU. And I think that whatever London and Paris do say together, I'm not talking about technical cooperation, different field, 
um, is an intriguing and interesting um, uh, field because I think that the uh, Brexit uh, has you know, created a new political reality. Uh, the French are very proud to say we are now the only nuclear power of the, of the European Union, you know, which I don't think makes a lot of sense in itself, by the way. Uh, but clearly, um, uh, there was a reason why Emmanuel Macron did not mention the EU when he talked about nuclear deterrence in his speech. It's, it is because clearly uh, we don't want this to be an EU question and we want to be able to tie the UK in one way or the other. Finally, very briefly, two questions. Why didn't you talk about Saudi Arabia? It seems to me that uh, as much as Turkey is, well, Turkey, um, I'm not impressed by Erdogan's declarations, which I think are pretty much the same language that the Shah of Iran uh, had in the uh, mid 70s. Uh, I'm not that, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm more sanguine than many analysts about the Saudi nuclear proliferation risk. I still, I'm still a bit puzzled by the fact that you did much mention Saudi Arabia. The reason may be that it's not a treaty based ally, but I'd like to push you forward a little bit. Uh, and finally, uh, there's an elephant in the room. The elephant is called sole purpose. And I was a bit surprised to see that you did not put more. Um, uh, content and the discussion on uh, Mr. Biden's plan to push for sole purpose and the consequences it would have, it uh, could have for uh, the allies. So I think this is a little bit of the elephant in the room and you feel free to forget all about my questions and comments, but do answer this one, please. Uh, would you care to give initial reaction to some of these comments and questions? I think it might be good if, you, if you're agreeable to do it before I take questions from before I already have a couple Questions. Might, you know, perhaps a very short comment on one point you raised about Franco-British uh, potential nuclear uh, cooperation. First of all, I don't think anyone's expecting dramatic developments in terms of the next two or three years because the need at the moment does not exist uh, because the Biden administration is not going to pursue the line that Trump was taking about uh, dismissing NATO's continuing uh, relevance. But we're thinking in terms of a much longer perspective. Uh, the next 20, 30 years, in, in nuclear terms, you have to start thinking about that now. What would we do if some successor to Biden, uh, either on their own initiative or because of the pressure of American public opinion, said, we are frankly more interested in China. Uh, our real interests as a Pacific as well as an Atlantic power uh, are the protection of the United States. The Europeans really have to do uh, substantially more to protect themselves. And the question then arises, is there any circumstance in which either France or the United Kingdom could perceive a strategic threat to themselves that wasn't a threat to the other? And, you know, we're next door neighbors. I mean, we couldn't be closer together than, than in any other way. And there is no conceivable way. I think this applies to Germany as well as it happens. But for the purpose of nuclear weapons, we're talking about France and United Kingdom. There is no purpose, the occasion you can envisage when a threat to France or the United Kingdom wasn't a threat to the other. And if that is right, then the sooner we start having a dialogue and thinking in terms of what might one day, we hope will not be necessary, but one day might be necessary, that if Europe had to face a potential aggression, let us say from a nuclear weapon, Russia and Federation, not necessarily Putin, some successor to Putin, how would Europe react if America wasn't there to protect it? And it can only be by France and Britain working with every other European state, particularly Germany, but having already got nuclear weapons, uh, that does give at least a deterrence capability that otherwise we would be completely naked, uh, uh, the whole of Europe would be completely naked to that kind of potential aggression. Right, right. Francois, quick, you wanted to jump in. Just two quick points. Uh, uh, first, on uh, uh, the nuclear role uh, of the French in particular, I understand that in the case of Britain, uh, the matter is not treated uh, in the same time frame as it is in France. Uh, for something to happen, you need uh, the concurrence of developments in three constituencies. The first constituency is the deterrer, in this case, France. Is France ready to think about playing new nuclear roles in favor of its allies and partners uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe? The answer to that one actually is yes. Uh, and uh, it hasn't been put to the test, but it's there. The second constituency is that of the beneficiaries 
of that deterrence. And Bruno, you said, you said it, I think, quite clearly early on. The beneficiaries are not exactly lining up for the moment. Uh, Berlin has not or not yet had a serious discussion on what it is that could be done uh, in addition to or alongside existing dispositions. But the third constituency, which we should never forget, is of course the constituency of the deterred. Will the deterred, the, the Russians in this particular case for the time being, uh, take it at all seriously? And the short answer to that, to the extent that one can give one, is that they're probably not going to consider that an unchanged disposition of forces, a qualitatively and quantitatively unchanged bundle of forces, is going to perform a wider mission than the mission which has been until now uh, given to it, particularly since the French have been underscoring over the last uh, decades. Uh, I remember writing language on this in the early 80s, uh, that we had a minimalist nuclear force strictly tailored to uh, the exigencies of French deterrence, etc. Uh, uh, having an unchanged nuclear force to perform a much broader set of missions would probably not uh, <coughs> impress, over impress the deterred. Your question on Saudi Arabia, I was actually going to throw it back at you in a way of saying, <clears throat> well, in the past, we, could, we probably would have worried more about Saudi Arabia because of the Pakistan connection. That one doesn't seem to be, seems to be in, in very great shape. If I'm worried about a country in the Arab world, I would actually be much more worried about the United Arab Emirates because they actually have a level of seriousness, competence, and know-how, uh, which in the field of military procurement broadly defined, uh, the Saudis simply uh, do not uh, do not have. Thank, 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 thank you. Um, I mean, I, and, and you get and you get you do get ten points, Francois, for mentioning that the deterrence is in the eyes of the beholder, primarily. Uh, so uh, I I, uh, I I could not agree more. Ivo, sort of two two points. Uh, one is sort of to to your first three sort of skeptical questions about what would the U.S. or the Allies or others do what we propose to do. I think the, the, the driving force of the report to, to um, uh, piggyback on what, what Sir Malcolm said uh, at the outset is to rethink how we think about these issues. And we have lost uh, for too long uh, uh, a concern or worry in both allied and in American nuclear planning about the prospect of our allies going nuclear. This was the main issue in the 1960s. And it led to a whole series of decisions, including the nuclear planning group uh, in NATO, uh, that were designed uh, uh, to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons among our allies. And what we're saying, and, and Francois quoting the, turning the nuclear salience into the discussion uh, as a piece of it, we need to get back to this issue. And our proposals are all designed to enhance that kind of discussion. And so I would say to the US nuclear planner, do they want allies to be part of the, that discussion? Perhaps not. But if making allies part of that discussion reduces the chance that they require their own nuclear weapons, then perhaps yes. Um, so I, I think that's the, 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 the the thrust of what we're trying to do. On the issue of sole purpose, we can have it and we should have uh, a, 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 at some point a, a good debate on this. I do not personally, uh, as someone actually pushed for sole purpose uh, 13 years ago uh, as the guiding philosophy for the, the incoming Obama administration, I do not believe that sole purpose and extended deterrence are incompatible. Uh, and, and, and I think I would push hard on that and have in the past and would do it in, in the future, which is why I don't think it's a big element. Um, that said, I don't think we would have an agreement among, the, uh, among all of us uh, if we had gone into this. And we wrote the report and really finished the report before the election. Uh, it was very much designed uh, to, to try to speak to an, a Trumpian, uh, Trump victory as well as a Biden victory. And we make the case that even Biden doesn't solve the problem. 
Uh, it may solve the problem rhetorically for a while, but it will require much more uh, than just a return to a Biden kind of foreign policy. And that's why we didn't get into the, uh, that for the, the sole purpose debate. But we can leave for another time whether we should get into it. Oh, thank you very much, Ivo. Uh, we already have three questions, which uh, I don't want to judge only by name, because they seem to come from Japan. At least these seem, seem to be Japanese names, which I think is it. So thank you, our Japanese colleagues, for, uh, for staying that late or for uh, getting up in the middle of the night. Uh, the questions are quite long, so I will summarize them for the benefit of our experts and audience. Uh, first question is about uh, the uh, what comes after the INF Treaty? Can the US, Russia, China, can the P5 and allies restore and rebuild a lost INF Treaty? Uh, I'd like to, so the question is quite long, so I think we'll just use this sentence as a springboard to, uh, for you to discuss, uh, should, you be, the, should you be willing to do so? Uh, what comes after the INF Treaty from your point of view, uh, not only on the nuclear domain, because this is not only uh, a nuclear discussion. The second question is uh, about, is I think a very intriguing one from the same person. Uh, how can the US and Russia incentivize, socialize China, the UK and France for arms control culture? Um, I think this is a little bit answered in your reports through the inspections uh, suggestion, but maybe you could um, make us a little bit more private to the kind of discussions you had in terms of how you see this concretely happening. And the third question is, I think, one that I more or less tried to, uh, to put to uh, Evo, but at least uh, one uh, seemingly Japanese uh, name uh, is also raising it. Given the difference between NATO and Asia, the lack of nuclear sharing collective security mechanism, how can the NPG and NPG concretely be adapted to Asia? Um, so uh, these are the three questions that I have so far. Uh, the floor is still open. Don't hesitate in, uh, in uh, writing short or long questions in the Q&A. Meanwhile, who would like to uh, take the floor? Who of you would like to tackle some of them? So I'll come. Uh, just I'd like to deal with the INF uh, issue. It's obviously highly desirable at some stage to try and go back to having an INF uh, treaty. But it also makes irre irrefutable logic that it, to some degree will have to include China. And the Chinese are not going to be terribly interested. Now, I think the, the curious phenomenon, once you get into INF, and it explains in part uh, Putin's behavior in breaching the INF Treaty, is ultimately Russia's threat at uh, this sort of level is not from Europe or from NATO or from the United States. It is potentially one day, not in the immediate or short term, it's from China. Uh, China and Russia share a huge uh, border. Uh, the whole eastern part of the Russian Federation has a minimal population of 150 million people in Russia. It's something like 10 or 15 million in eastern Russia, including Vladivostok and that area. And of course, parts of eastern Russia, far eastern Russia, were parts of the old Chinese empire. And uh, it, 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 it has to be at least a possibility, and some would say a serious possibility, uh, that over the next 20 years, 20, 30 years, it may be far less time than that. Uh, Russia and China are going to have the same sort of disputes they had during the Cold War. There, there already was one uh, military conflict on the uh, Soviet-Chinese border um, uh, many years ago. So against that background, uh, one can see a potential common interest, strange as it may seem today, between Russia on the one hand and the United States and Euro Western Europe uh, on the other, uh, that we all recognize the, Ameri the Russians will not admit this at the moment, they won't admit it under Putin, but they know perfectly well that that is where ultimately uh, their long-term threat is going to come from. Yes, thank you, Sir Mark. I think uh, if I understand your, your point correctly, you're saying they will come around eventually, um, which I think is a little bit of a French way of thinking. So let's call it a European way of thinking about Russia and China. I, I mean, I do take your points. You know, a lot of well, eventually, I mean, is, is a long time, and it's not going to be under Putin. Uh, yeah. Not because he would necessarily disagree with the logic of what we're saying, uh, but because for the time being, it suits Russia and China uh, to be very close friends, uh, even although there's inherent contradictions in that. It's a bit like Erdogan and Putin pretending that they like each other. 
uh, when we all know that the geopolitics ultimately means that Russia and Turkey will be competitors. I, I, I would put it much I, more I, simply. I, 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 tend, I tend to agree with you. Uh, Francois? I would put it much more simply. Putin suggested in his uh, 2007 speech at the Munich Security Conference to multilateralize the INF Treaty. Uh, so all of the points you're making, Malcolm, are actually proven by Putin himself. When he made when when he made that statement, and I don't think it was a uh, an entirely bogus statement. He never liked the bilateral INF treaty, uh, and was quite ready to discard it as we as we eventually saw. Uh, but for the reasons that you indicated, uh, to those reasons you have to add other nuclear reasons like North Korea, Pakistan, India, Israel, possibly Iran, all of whom possess intermediate range missiles as defined in the treaty. Uh, so if you want to have a new INF treaty, you're going to have to de-globalize it. And I don't see that happening by any stretch. And of course, the Europeans were really only worried about INF during the Cold War, because the SS-20s were a new and solid rung in the Red Army's uh, escalatory ladder of the time. There is no escalatory ladder around today and the notion that the Russians have intermediate range missiles on top of the other sorts of uh, missiles doesn't actually make nearly as much an impression in Europe as do other things like uh, A2 a AD bubbles or stuff of that sort. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't know whether anybody's going to come around to anything on this one uh, any, any, any time soon. Maybe let me. Uh, uh, all right, Ivo, please. Jumping in on, on the on the Asia nuclear planning group, I I I agree with Francois and, and and Malcolm on the desirability, but also the difficulty of getting back to the INF treaty in whatever form uh, it is. And and I in fact long thought that the only way to get to that is to think about banning all land based missiles above 500 kilometers, so including ICBMs because then you have some other reason for people to, to join in. But that's a different, uh, a different discussion. On the Asia MPG, you know, there's no doubt that as long as there are differences among Asian uh, uh, allies, and clearly between South Korea and Japan today, there are differences, it's going to be hard uh, to multilateralize uh, anything. Uh, and indeed, uh, the, the, the situation has deteriorated, between the two countries has deteriorated significantly. Uh, it is in the U.S. interest, and it is in a non-proliferation uh, uh, among allies' interest of the United States to overcome, as we in fact also uh, argue in the report, the the differences between Seoul and Tokyo, and help get back to a trilateral security uh, structure. Uh, we we are arguing that it may be useful uh, to resolve that in a larger, you know, as, as Eisenhower said, if the if the problem is too big, enlarge it. Uh, and to think about enlarging the problem in two ways. One, by bringing Australia into a, into a quadrilateral discussion about nuclear weapons among three allies with the United States. That's the Asia NPG. Uh, and, uh, and while we will continue to have bilateral discussions, which are necessary because these are bilateral treaties, uh, to uh, also multilateralize that discussion in order to overcome some of the the bilateral uh, issues among allies, and we potentially look at enlarging the Quad. Uh, if in South Korea there were an interest in joining the Quad, uh, is that something that the Quad should be discussing? And we at least put the question both to the South Korea, is this something you would be interested in? And to the other Quad uh, members, to the four Quad members to say, is this something you ought to be discussing? Uh, and and uh, in order to enlarge the problem, because if you keep it in the bilateral channel, you know where it's going to end up. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have uh, 10 minutes and uh, three or four additional questions. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm just going to read the gist of the questions phrase, and I'll give you uh, two minutes each of you for closing uh, comments, and you will answer uh, any question you would like. Um, an anonymous uh, participant wonders about the impact of the nuclear ban treaty on NATO. Um, Benoît Abouville, our good friend that, that we all know, uh, has a specific question for Evo. Uh, wondering whether Evo uh, still pleads for a withdrawal of non-strategic nuclear weapons from 
Europe. But I think the, end, the the report does address that. But feel free, Ivo, to uh, to uh, to to comment. Um, two other requests for comments on. Um, President Macron's speech of last year, but I think we more or less addressed that. Uh, Non-proliferation aspects on, in uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy of US and European states, that's an interesting and uh, maybe missing component, uh, at least on the European side. And finally, another question from, or uh, probably Japanese friends, or apologize if, uh, uh, if he or she is not, uh, is the question of, um, a hypothetical summit on strategic stability and nuclear risk reduction in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we will do want to finish at 5.30 CET sharp, so no more than two or three minutes each in, the, in reverse order, maybe Francois first, then uh, Samarkin, and then finally Evo. Francois, you're muted. Francois, you're muted. You're muted, Francois. Muted, I am muted, I am unmuted. Uh, um, on non-strategic weapons, American non-strategic weapons in Europe, there's going to be a there's going to be possibly quite soon a very practical moment, and that is if we get a uh, so-called uh, black a green coalition in Germany at the next general elections. Angela Merkel, as you know, is leaving the chance the chancellor's office and there will be a new chancellor and there will be new elections and the greens may well be part of that uh, the greens have a very strong anti-nuclear streak to them not anti-military i would add but anti-nuclear and uh in the coalition formation discussions this is going to be a hard difficult issue that really is everything that i have to say until now, except for one point on indo-pacific and non-proliferation. 15 years ago, 25 years ago, sorry, 25 years ago, the Europeans actually had some involvement in the North Korean nuclear file with the so-called uh, Korean Energy Development Organization. This was part of the package uh, to convince the North Koreans to stop their nuclear madness. Uh, since then, we have disappeared from the scene, and this is a shame. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sir Markham. Uh, yes, just very, very briefly also on uh, the Asia-Pacific uh, issues. Um, North Korea, of course, now is a nuclear weapon state. It's not been acknowledged as one, but it, it, it is one. And uh, th that means we're not just talking about academic or theoretical possibilities in the future. And one of the, I find one of the mysteries is that this is not only of massive concern to South Korea and Japan and the United States and the rest of us, but somehow China is not willing to use uh, the undoubted pressure it could bring on North Korea uh, to get it to actually actively participate in some solution to this uh, problem. Now, the Chinese may have their own short-term rationale uh, for not wanting to interfere with North Korea and make life difficult for the Americans and Japanese and South Koreans. But ultimately, one has to ask the question, does China really believe its own security is enhanced when not only do you have a new nuclear power on its own borders, but one which, because of the nature of the North Korean regime, is volatile, unpredictable, uh, and which could use its nuclear weapons or threaten to use them uh, in a quite incoherent way. I don't begin to understand why the people in Beijing don't seem to understand that their interests on this specific issue of North Korea are not that different uh, from uh, other countries uh, in the region. And we know China could make a difference. At one stage, China was prepared privately to put massive economic sanctions on North Korea until it made certain concessions and came back into a state of negotiation. Uh, and they basically cut off 90% uh, of uh, Korean uh, import, North Korean imports uh, from China. Uh, it was short term, but it worked. Uh, yet since then, they seem to have lost interest. I don't begin to understand it. Thanks to both of you. I think it's actually very interesting that our two European participants uh, emphasize uh, our interests in the North Korean um, nuclear issue so much. It's another testimony to the fact that we Europeans are caring uh, more and more about what's happening in that part of the world. Eva, if you're always yours, you have uh, something like four minutes for any closing comments or remarks. 
um, uh, just on, on North Korea, I spent uh, four years at the at the NATO at the NAC table, reminding our uh, our European friends that uh, a nuclear threat to Canada or the United States is an Article Five contingency, so they better pay attention. Uh, uh, and uh, that threat, by the way, has only gotten worse uh, uh, into uh, uh, given given the reach of uh, land, land and now sea based missiles uh, that the North Koreans are deploying. So it is it is and ought to be uh, an interest. Uh, to all, uh, all uh, to everyone, including the Chinese, but also to uh, all of our friends in Europe. Uh, to Benoit's uh, uh, important question, we do call uh, in this report for a serious discussion on uh, uh, on forward-based systems without necessarily uh, having uh, any view about where that leads. Uh, uh, Thirty-five years, thirty years ago, I guess. I did call for the removal of all tactical nuclear weapons uh, uh, from uh, U.S. Uh, um, allied territory. Uh, it was a time when uh, the Soviet Union was collapsing and we were all worried about the, the sanctity of, of, of particularly tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, there was a, a major move uh, in reducing those weapons in Europe. And of course, they were eliminated from South Korea. And we've had extended deterrence for 30 years. Uh, uh, without a, a nuclear, a, a American nuclear presence on the territory of the South Koreans. Now, there is a debate about that, uh, including in South Korea. There are some that are saying today that because of the North Korean threat in particular, and quietly because of the Chinese nuclear threat, that needs to be revisited. And that's why uh, we, uh, we are putting this issue uh, on the agenda. Um, and it's not, uh, you know, I, I think it would be wise to be ahead of it. Uh, uh, rather than having to respond to it because of uh, a German coalition politics, which, by the way, we did we had to do in twenty what was it twenty ten when uh, uh, when uh, the coalition agreement also called for the withdrawal of nuclear weapons, NATO nuclear weapons uh, from German soil at that at that point. Uh, we should have a, a serious discussion about these issues. Uh, this is this is what raising the salience in the relationship means. Uh, and we should have a serious discussion about the extent to which the credibility of the American guarantee depends on the physical presence of nuclear weapons on one's territory. Uh, uh, last I looked, there are co quite a number of NATO allies who do not have U.S. nuclear weapons on their territory and still think that the uh, nuclear guarantee is real and, uh, and, and strong. But that's the discussion uh, that we are raising. And to think about these issues uh, a, a new in a way that, frankly, we probably haven't done, as I said, since the late 1970s and the early 1980s, and really not since the 1960s when it was a, a, an even greater concern. And that's why we wrote the report. That's why we uh, thought it was important to ask questions that people don't want to ask uh, or have forgotten to ask, uh, offer some recommendations to how you deal with it, and, uh, and begin a discussion. And so I welcome having had the opportunity to have the discussion here today. Thank you so much, Ivo. Uh, this panel was not not exactly a 21st century panel. I mean, you know, we're uh, the five of us are uh, over 50 uh, white male gray beards, or at least there's one gray beard there. But I do think that the discussion, just like the report, is very forward looking and extremely original. So even though that this hour has been very dense, I think the report itself is, um, uh, which is also very dense, uh, has more to it, so I encourage uh, the audience to actually read it because we could not cover everything that was in it. I'd like to thank all of you, all the participants, and most uh, particularly uh, Sir Malcolm, Francois, and uh, yourself, Ivo. Thank you for convening and producing this report. Thanks to all of you. We had a, a fantastic one hour conversation, but this is only the beginning. We'll have uh, more to talk about in the coming months about these issues. Thanks to all.